generally, the only time I'll set an alarm is if I've got a flight to go catch earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you know, I wake up when I wake up. Um, I've got the freedom to go and hit the gym every morning yeah. and then, you know, go and do a workout, do everything I need to, you know, put my body and mind in a, um, a great state to come back and be super productive on, yeah. uh, you know, building and running this, the, the businesses that I run now. Welcome to the Get Invested Podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, sometimes have no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You will hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening and now let's get invested. Welcome Freedom Fighters. Today I want to stretch your minds and take you on a very different journey so that I can get you out of your comfort zone. I want to open your mind to the opportunities that our current technological age offers us to live life on our own terms. You see, I believe that there's never been a better time to be alive, and our options are absolutely limitless to achieve freedom and to do what we want to do. We just need to do the research, do the due diligence, and then just do the work and make it happen. We all need to earn it and make the sacrifices, but there's just no excuse. And today's guest is the perfect example of how you can make that happen. You see, just over five years ago, Kevin Graham had a nice, comfortable government IT job in little old Adelaide town. Life was good, it was comfortable, but it wasn't great. He felt trapped on the treadmill and he was sick and tired of dancing to someone else's tune. You see, his progress was always dependent on others and he just yearned to take control of his life. Now, roll forward to today and he is now a globetrotting gypsy based in Chiang Mai in Thailand, who has built a strong location-independent business that gives him the freedom and the flexibility to do what he likes, when he likes, and where he likes. So how has he achieved this financial and time freedom so quickly, and how has he managed to transform his life in such a short period of time? Well, to find out, and to see how you can start to break free, enjoy this very thought-provoking chat with online marketer and SEO consultant, Kevin Graham. Welcome back, Freedom Fighters. It's Bushy Martin. And today we're taking a slightly divergent path because we've got the rare opportunity to talk to a globetrotting lifestyle independent entrepreneur who... He's an Adelaide boy who's really seen an opportunity to build a lifestyle for himself. Uh, He now resides in the beautiful part of the world in Chiang Mai in Thailand, and he's been good enough to give some of his time today to have a chat to us. So welcome aboard, Kevin. Great to be here, Bushy, and um, just a huge thank you there for not using the term digital nomad, which I know (laughs) is like thrown around a, a lot of, you know, with the, the location independent business uh, circle. And uh, it sounded like you almost went there and then just like <laughs> darted off at the last second away from that. So so thank you. I appreciate that. My pleasure, mate. I, and the only reason I did that is that I read some of your stuff that talked about how you hated that term. So I've uh, <laughs> dodged around that landmine very delicately, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but mate, um, look uh, to those who who don't know Kevin Graham. Just to kick things off, can you give us a rundown on who you are and what you do and why you're doing it, mate? Yeah, certainly. So, so right now I'm a location independent business owner, as you said. Um, I run two different businesses. Uh, one 
is focused around building and managing a portfolio of uh, product review websites, which mostly target the US market. And basically, they'll, they'll cover reviews of products. When people click through to Amazon from those sites and make a purchase, then we earn a commission on those uh, transactions. Yep. The other business um, that sort of came out of the back of that first business is a, a web hosting company. Um, now, initially, I built one that was super targeted into the uh, search engine optimization space, yep. uh, basically solving the, the problems that I had in uh, building and running uh, the the product uh, product review uh, portfolio, yep. um, and then from there we've then uh, developed now our own like uh, retail offering of uh, web hosting services that targets um, individuals and small businesses looking to get online, and some of that uh, that brand that we've been growing more recently over the last six months has been driven through acquisitions of other small hosting companies as well so it's okay. it's um it's, it's almost a little bit of a split focus between the the two businesses um but um i'm the sort of guy that you know really needs a bunch going on during the the day to to keep <laughs> me entertained keep me excited so uh it's it's perfect for me yeah, gotcha. Awesome. Now, that's a really interesting journey that you've been on. And uh, Can I ask what vintage are you, mate? How, how are you, buddy? Uh, 33 now. 33, yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to wind back the clock here. I, 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 let me drill into the why for a minute, and then I want to wind back the clock and get you to take us through the journey from living in good old Adelaide to uh, where you went to and how you ended up where you are now. Uh, but before we do that, can you just sort of why are you doing what you're doing? What's what's the benefit to you and others? Well, I mean, for for me, the benefit is complete freedom over my time and location. Um, yeah. So you're, you're right that I'm calling to you right now from uh, Chiang Mai in Thailand, but I've just spent the last six months on the road with uh, three months in the US um, and three months in Europe. Awesome. So, and during that whole time, you know, been continuing to to build and grow the the business um i've got you know a team of people that work with me as well so that uh, during some of those times i was more settled so i did like two and a half three weeks in brooklyn new york i did um uh, a month in austin texas two months in berlin but there are other times where it was just you know one night in um Zermatt in Switzerland, which is where you know, the Matterhorn is, and then nice. straight on to a, another town the next night, and you know, yeah. a, a much faster pace of travel where you definitely can't get work done. Um, yeah. But you know, having that freedom of being able to go and enjoy that uh, travel component, uh, which was big for me, um, and you know, also having the time to you know, every morning I'll go and hit the gym. Um, so all those things are factors that you know, I previously couldn't do when I was working, as well as, you know, really being able to love the work that I do do now. Yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I guess the parallel between what you're doing and, and what uh, myself and my wife have done is that, uh, you know, 20 years ago, my wife and I had this epiphany that uh, uh, if we really wanted to enjoy freedom and uh, make decisions on our own terms, then we needed to create a vehicle that, would give us time back because you're not free unless you've got time on your hands. And you only got time on your hands if your income is being looked after through other sources. And, uh, you know, we've sort of pursued that journey pretty aggressively over time and we now enjoy similar freedom. We're off to Europe about next week for a month and just meandering through from Amsterdam down to Budapest and then up to Prague and just sort of poking around having a, a good look. And we do that on a pretty regular basis. And it sounds to me like the, the why for you has been pretty similar in terms of being in, in control of your own life and your own destiny so you can do what you want when you want without having to dance to someone else's tune. Would that be a fair summary? That's, that's a very fair summary. And, um, you know, that was kind of the journey that um, my partner Richard and I started on back in, um, I think it was about 2011, 2012, I think 2012, okay. where we, um, you know, We'd started uh, getting into that same uh, mindset of, okay, we need to free up that time um, 
And we actually started with real estate as going to be that vehicle for us as well. Okay. Um, so what were you doing at that time, mate? So you, you're back in Adelaide at that stage. What, what were you yep. you doing? Why did you suddenly start? Or what was the thinking behind, right, we need to do something here? Yeah, so so at that time I was um, working for SA Health in their IT department and I you know, had that, those same feelings of like, well, I want a bit more freedom over my time, a bit more flexibility about, you know, uh, you know, what I do when I do these things. And, um, I think some of it was on the back of a, uh, four or five week holiday in Europe as well. And so it was like, okay, well, no, like there, there are people out there that, you know, I know that are doing this, you know, have a bit more flexibility and freedom and okay, how, how are they doing it and start to, you know, delve into that. Um, which is when, um, yeah, that's, so that's when we, uh, I think that was also on the back of I'd uh, built my own PPOR, so bought a block of land, built a PPOR, like a primary place of residence, my yeah. house, um, yeah. up in Manham. Um, okay. And when when I sold that, which was just leading into the uh, the Europe trip, I think that the, the uh, settlement cleared, you know, a few days before I took off to Europe. Yeah. You know, there was a nice little cash windfall from the the difference in. Um, you know, what it costs to, to buy a vacant block of land and put a house on it yeah. versus what the market considered to be the price for a finished dwelling, yeah. um, which I didn't know going in. But after that, I was like, oh, okay, and started to learn a bit more about that. Um, mm. And then from from there, um, we then actually completed a total of three of those um, up in Port Pirie at Port Perry was great for that where um, you could buy a block of land for about 30 grand for, yeah. you know, three to three to 500 square metres, which is, you know, plenty enough for a, a single dwelling house. Yep. Um, you go hit up River Gum and for about 100 grand, they would build, you know, a 100 square metre uh, built on site, three bedroom house um, that was, you know, quite nice to live in, yep. um, a little bit smaller than the one that I had built and lived in, but, you know, still spacious yep. um and on the back of that like so one of those projects all in would cost about 140 150 yep. and like thousand and then you could rent that for about 230 to 250 nice. a week that's massive um, so <laughs> nice cash flow positive you know eight or that's seven or eight percent um mm sort of situation which is it's great right um yeah but of course the problem that you face with that is limited capital um yeah and so you know you, you build three of them and you know your capital's sort of tapped out um yeah and you know also i probably don't want 10 or 20 of them all sitting in port perry which you know it's yeah. a great city it's the home of the largest lead smelter in the southern hemisphere yeah. that the rental yields are great but you know, when it comes time to sell, that's a very slow market with, yeah. you know, I think the last stat I looked at was average time on market. There's um, 368 days or something. So yeah. basically, you know, it takes you more than a year when you actually want to sell. So, you know, yeah. it's not a very liquid market um, if you're you know looking to try and turn these properties at a reasonable pace. If you're just looking yeah. to buy and hold and sit on them for 15 years, great. Um, but, yeah, you know, different motivations, obviously. Yeah, and that's that age-old argument of cash flow versus capital growth, I think, that, that revolves around the property market in particular. And uh, I think the the limitation of going for cash flow early is that the cash flow properties tend to be in areas that don't enjoy much growth. And uh, capacity caps you out. You get to a point where you can't do any more. And that yes, they're positive cash flow, but it's not enough to retire on. And um, uh, that's that's a great conundrum uh, around that that uh, model of investing. So you obviously came to that conclusion at some point. And uh, what happened then, mate? So where did we go from there? So you were with SA Health. You'd, you'd uh, done a number of properties. Uh, what was the next trigger that started you uh, down? Uh, your current path yeah so um basically the, the sort of progression was um from the property then starting to discover um as some of the people making you know, decent sums of money online um 
So through those um, uh, essay connections and the, the essay basketball connections, um, another name came up. Uh, so in the in the uh, property stuff, uh, there was a, an essay guy who I believe you're having on the podcast soon, uh, Ben Fitz. Yes. Um, yes. Who who um, was sort of the the local. Uh, connection and jumped on stage during one of the um steve mcknight uh, presentations and uh fitzy was talking about a property that he'd done down at uh, marion this student accommodation and uh you know building that and working on that and yeah um strangely enough at the time uh, ben was connected with the the south australian basketball community uh, there was another guy also in that community who ran a, a forum uh isaac um and so Isaac, For- Isaac Foreman, who ran the, the Hoops Basketball Forum, yeah. um, was you know, also in that South Australian basketball community, okay. um, ran, runs a web design company, but all, ran also on the side a portfolio of uh, websites that basically he'd put these little uh, uh, ad blocks on from Google AdSense and yep. earn some revenue from that. Okay. Um, and so I started... I think it was in earlier 2013. I started emailing back and forth with um, Isaac about that. Yeah. Um, got some tips. Started building a few sites on the side, and then continued to follow that um, path further in. And so that's when I started to discover like the podcast of at the time um, a small like a couple guys out of the Philippines uh, who were Americans called at the time they were called AdSense flippers. Yep. Now they're called empire flippers and they're moved on and they're sort of like the, the biggest uh, or one of the big marketplaces for buying and selling websites online. Okay. Um, at the time their whole, their whole focus was just using their own team to build these sites for them and then selling them. Yep. Um, and so I sort of found them and then you'd start, you know, pulling at threads and following the, the related stuff within that uh, area and then found like the, the niche pursuits blog, found the tropical NBA podcast and started listening to all those things and going, okay, well I get that, you know, these uh, small cash flow positive properties aren't going to necessarily be the thing that's going to buy me my freedom by, you know, age 30 roughly yeah. um yeah which was which was the goal that i was working towards um yeah. and so i was like okay this isn't going to work this uh, online stuff seems to work or seems to be working for these guys and you know started to follow into that further um and so like uh towards the end of um 2013 actually sold a website uh through the the adsense flippers empire flippers guys for about three grand us um which was you know 3500 four grand aussie yeah. um and you know going through that process I'm like okay cool well at that point um well by that point richard and i had made the decision to um to move out to asia uh, we basically sat there um <laughs> there was um it was like one saturday night we're like okay now this is this is it. Like, let's make a plan and actually, uh, like, quit our jobs, give up on this, and uh, you know, go out to Asia and try and make a go of this. Um, so that was like one night in June or July. We're sitting there and basically in the the upstairs uh, spare bedroom, which was uh, the the office that he was running his um, small tax accounting agency out of, okay. and I was you know using for my um, you know I was just running the online business stuff out of there yep. um and it had you know built-in mirror robes and so we sat there on this saturday night with the whiteboard <laughs> markers out and wrote out this this huge timeline of you know a 12-month timeline of okay you know at this point we'll quit our jobs you know we'll save this amount by here blah 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 blah, blah. Yep. um and then i said 12 months like a year that's it that feels like forever like how can we compress that and then we <laughs> You know, slowly started cutting it back from like twelve to like nine months to eight months, and then to like six. Um, and so, in that six months, we then you know went through the process of quitting our jobs, um, getting the 
the vaccinations we needed to move out to Asia. Now, initially, we were going to move to uh, Davao in the Philippines, which is where the AdSense Flippers, Empire Flippers guys were based at the time. Um, just, just jumping in there, mate, the decision to move was based on uh, reducing cost, uh, living cost, as well as swimming with uh, the pool of people who are doing the same thing. Was that the motivation for doing that? Correct. So the, the double uh, benefit there of... Um, you know, initially we we're looking at Davao in the Philippines for that because, you know, lower cost of living yep. um, and, you know, like-minded uh, entrepreneurs that you could, you know, connect with, network with and, uh, you know, trade ideas, yeah. get ideas, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, but, of course, uh, so like the AdSense Flippers guys on their podcast were talking about the, the community that was out there in Davao um, in the Philippines um, and then, uh, you know, Looking at the travel warnings from uh, Smart Traveller, uh, there was a travel warning for the, the Mindanao province, which is where Davao is. Okay. Um, so, Mindanao, so yeah, that, I've got a brother-in-law who lives in uh, in that province, actually, in the Philippines. So, uh, yeah, it's an interesting part of the world. Yeah, so, so that area therefore meant that um, if we went there, then travel insurance wouldn't cover us. Um, yeah. So we started looking, okay, well, where else are these people uh centered and the uh city chain by in thailand like in you know the mountains of northern thailand just keep kept popping up on a bunch of blogs um yeah. and so like okay well chain my thailand it is um and so you know we then went through all the process of okay you know how do we get a visa and as australians we're super lucky to be able to get um a working holiday visa, um, which, you know, if you're 30 and yeah. under, you get, you know, 12 months, multiple entry, um, yep. which, you know, made it really easy to easy. Uh, to live out here. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, went through that process of, you know, get the vaccinations, pack the bags, everything, and, um, you know, landed here in January 2014 and basically hit the ground running on trying to build, um, you know, this portfolio of sites out. Um mm. And the the first big shift that we did there right at the start was um, rather than focusing on those uh, AdSense sites where, you know, you'd earn a few cents from every ad click, yeah. uh, we then shifted to the, the idea of doing the, the Amazon uh, product review websites where you'd get, you know, up to 8 8.5% of um, everything that the customer purchased oh, awesome. um, when they clicked through. Was so, that, Was that due to a change? Did Amazon make a change in their um, affiliate exercise at some point that suddenly made that attractive? Because uh, the Amazon affiliate stuff's been around for a long time. Uh, was there some sort of trigger point that then uh, suddenly opened that up as a much better business opportunity? Well, so, so what really... <sighs> Highlighted that opportunity was uh, Spencer from Niche Pursuits, who previously had also you know, been doing the same thing as Isaac Foreman, you know, building those um, Google AdSense sites. Yeah. Um, and he went through and built um, two case study sites during uh, 2013, um, which were focused on the the Amazon uh, Amazon Associates program as the monetization. And yeah, when you start to see the, the money that he was generating off of those sites. So uh, I think it was either the first or the second site that he built there was doing, you know, 2000 a month um, US. You're like, okay, mm. like to, to cover your living expenses in Chiang Mai and Thailand, um, you pretty much need one of those sites making two grand a month. And, you know, for two of you, you're, you know, living a comfortable enough existence without drawing down on savings at all. Yeah. Um, if you're one guy you know, on two grand US a month here, you can be out drinking every night and doing whatever you want. Um. <laughs> Love it. So just sort of boiling it down then, what I'm, what I'm hearing is uh, you're saying, right, we're looking for a vehicle that's going to give us the freedom and the time and generate the income that's going to do that. Uh, you're starting to, to go down this rabbit hole with saying, right, uh, we can see some real benefit in online business. There, there's some really easy monetization here in the Amazon space because all we need to do is I- identify a product that no one's really covered off on. Uh, we can become the almost the amplifier and the go-to place 
uh, for people who are searching for that to come to my site and say, right, here's all these reviews, here's the pros and the cons. You, you establish yourself as an authority in in that particular niche, and and therefore every sale that comes out of that exercise, with you being that uh, funnel point, is giving you an income stream. But it's also building a, a business that has value that then you've got the opportunity to sell at a profit at some point in time. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, correct. Um, and you know the the whole situation there. Um, at at that time, the the multiples on selling an online business were twenty months of profit. Um, so you could basically um, you you pay fifteen percent of that to the broker. So you'd basically bring forward just under. Uh, a year and a half worth of the profits from that site in one big payday if you sold a site, um, mm. which, you know, is is a very attractive offer, uh, especially at the start when you're trying to build some more capital. How does the, uh, you know, the old brain jumps into tax mode here? Uh, is uh, Chiang Mai a tax haven in that regard? Are you able to protect the amount that you've been giving to either a Thai government or, or secondary into an Australian government if you want to bring money back in? How does that work, mate? Yeah, um, so I'm not a lawyer. Don't quote me on this, all this sort of stuff. <laughs> sure. Um uh, but the, the couple of uh, little uh, interesting parts there that I can touch on are that um, Thailand has no controlled foreign company laws, yep. uh, which makes it very uh, easy and attractive to, to set up. Um, and they only tax you on revenues if you bring them into the country in the year that they're generated. Right. So right. you can then go and set up in Singapore, for example, for yep. your company. Yep. Um, 15% corporate taxation down there in nice. Singapore. Nice. Um, and then, you know, bring the money in in the year after you earn it and Love you're it. not paying local taxation here. So it's, you know, there are definitely some advantages that, um, you know, like Australia has CFC laws, uh, control foreign company laws. So that entire structure of, you know, setting up in Singapore just wouldn't work. Yeah, and I love it, mate. So the, what, what I'm what I'm hearing is that uh, what you've effectively done is t- taken a similar model to the uh, the build, hold, and sell exercise that you might adopt in a property sense, but you're concertaneering the period. So we're we're probably going from fifteen years to one. And uh, it's also it's still generating an income stream, so it's giving you cash flow along the journey. There's very low entry costs from from what I'm hearing, so it's not taking a, a massive amount to kick this off. And then you've got the ability to turn that over, and then war chest, and then uh, over time by doing multiples of these things, accumulate a a, um, a war chest of funds that then can ultimately fund your lifestyle long term. Am I reading that correctly? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think 12 months is probably um, – it's, it's tough to say because, like, for, for us when we started, it was um, probably about 14 months uh, from when we started building the, the first website after landing in Chiang Mai yeah. to uh, when we actually turned around and uh, sold that one. Okay. Um, but, you know, nowadays I'd probably say it's more like a 24-month thing. Um, okay. And, you know, if if you factor in also, you know, the, the year of 2013 that I spent in, you know, experimenting and building that stuff, plus, you know, having, um, you know, like I started building websites when I was uh, 12 or 13 years old, um, uh-huh. you know, back in like 97, 98. So, okay. you know, I, I definitely leaned on some of those skills that, you know, I've been building and developing for for years yeah. uh, to, uh, you know, turn around and build a site in 12 months and sell it. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's – um, I definitely don't want to uh, mislead the audience by saying, yeah, sure, in 12 short months this can be you because like, <laughs> no. um, especially, you know, as time's gone on and there have been more and more Google updates, that's becoming increasingly difficult to do. Yeah, and I guess th- this is the changing space you're in. It's uh, – you know, for a, a conservative, crusty old bugger like me who, who 
uh, likes a bit of certainty, properties work beautifully because it's like the Titanic. You know, you can see the icebergs coming and you can do something about it. But in the dynamics of the online world, uh, 12 months is like a decade uh, in anything else. So uh, I could see where in 2014 it was almost like uh, the gold rush, I'm guessing, uh, in terms of jumping in and taking advantage of some really gaping holes uh, as an opportunity to just tap in as a intermediary in the whole Amazon space. But uh, yeah. I could also imagine that uh, with changing algorithms from uh, the online process and then other competition for a lot of other people flooding in to, who've seen a similar opportunity, the the openings now must be uh, much thinner. And the uh, I'm guessing that over that four years, your business model has probably changed quite substantially. Can you talk talk to us a bit about that? Yeah, definitely. So, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> both both of those factors. Um, you sort of um, with with the online space, you're kind of beholden to uh, two masters. The the first one being Amazon, who um, you know, if you're monetizing through them, uh, they can turn around and change the terms of their agreement, or you know, like. So in March last year, they they did a big uh, rate adjustment, uh, which basically wiped somewhere between twenty five and thirty three percent off of the uh, top line of wow. uh, all of our sites. Wow. Um, basically, by shifting from this uh, system where the more items you sold, the higher um, your total commission rate was, to the commissions being per category, um, and you know depending on the category. You know, so some of the items that you were earning eight, eight and a half percent on are now all of a sudden, you know, four percent. Um, or even like if you're in the toys niche, that went all the way down to three percent. So, mm. you know, like just overnight, um, you know, bang, there's that change. And the, the other, uh, you know, scary thing that's always around is Google and Google updates. Um, and so, Google are always, you know, constantly trying to change and modify their algorithm to make um, make sure that, you know, our job as a, a search engine optimization people is you know, increasingly tough because mm. although some people might not like to think about it this way, Google's search engine really is a paid search engine with some free results down the bottom. Yeah. Um, Yep. So, you know, the first handful of results you always see there, unless you've got an ad blocker installed, will always be in a slightly different color. They'll have, like, ad written next to them in yep. very faint text. Um, yep. And those people are paying to, to be there. Um, yep. And so, you know, their, their business model is selling ads, which, hey, everyone needs to make money. I understand that's their business model. Um, yep. But, yeah, so anything that detracts from their ability to to sell the most ads, um, which, you know, SEO kind of does in that, you know, if you're trying to uh, reverse engineer and work out which signals their algorithm takes or needs in order to rank you, uh, you know, in the first page, um, you know, obviously they don't like that because they want to sell ads. And so you've got that um, sort of, I guess, risk, you know, looming over your head constantly of, you um, you know, generally in a year they'll do a couple of major algorithm updates. So the most recent one just happened um, at the start of August. And then, you know, there's that period of time where everyone goes, okay, what have they done? Which sites of mine have been hit? How can I get them back? Or are they dead now? Um, all that sort of stuff. Mm, it's a very dynamic space. And do you get much warning on the the imminent changes th through either Amazon or Google, or is it just bang, it happens overnight, and then it's it's a deal with it? Uh, so for that rate change from Amazon, they uh, spoke to a, you know, a handful of people, uh, the, the larger affiliates, and said, hey, this is coming down and here's, here's the new rates. But generally you uh, just get an email the the day before the start of the new month saying, hey, there's changes to the product, uh, like the operating agreement, here's the new details. Um, and so whenever those emails come in like once a month, you're like, ah, what, what have they done? And you have a look and uh, generally it's a minor thing. But, you know, with that huge rate change last year, that was, uh, you know, had everyone in 
I had that space sort of scrambling and recalculating and going, okay, well, if my sales were this, what is it going to be worth in the new system? Um, mm. All that sort of stuff. Mm. And I mean, with, with Google, it's totally reactive. So there are a bunch of um, sites, companies out there that basically monitor a huge bunch of uh, different keywords or search terms that people use. Mm. Um, and then uh, they basically create what they sort of call a weather report, but it's a backwards looking weather report right. based on you know, how much uh, fluctuation you're seeing, uh, how much turbulence you're seeing in the search engine results on any one given day. And so you can look at those uh, things and go, okay, well, we're in a turbulent period and then, uh, you know, go from there to determine whether, because quite often, I mean, this most recent one, Google announced that, yes, hey, there was an update, but quite often now they're... Um, they're being very secretive about whether they've actually made a change in the algorithm or not. Mm, okay, so you're second guessing what it is and what the impact's going to be to some degree. Yeah, you know, it's mm, like to, to try and relate it. Yeah, to try and relate it back to a property thing though as well. The other thing that you know sort of happens is um, it's kind of the equivalent of um, you know some suburban back street then becoming the a main road or vice versa of you know that traffic that's going past your property your website right yeah, um yeah. and the other thing that can happen as well is um you can actually get a a penalty from google for you know breaching their webmaster guidelines um and in, in that sort of scenario you end up with the equivalent of the council coming and just ripping out the street in front of your property because it just totally disappears from Google. Mm, crikey. Yeah, okay. There's a real science in uh, weaving your way through that then. then so I, I yeah. guess the, I, what I'm interested then um, uh, to sort of take this forward, uh, mate, is um, you've obviously got a, a, a plan in your head of and I'd, let's jump to the end game for a minute and say okay what does your uh perfect lifestyle look like kevin and uh, what sort of an income uh, and you don't need to give the, the numbers but uh, because of the sort of process we, we often take people through on the property journey is that the, we don't even talk about property first we talk about well let's talk about why you're doing this and where do you want to end up over what time frame? So, you know, we, we have a thing called the freedom numbers where we say, okay, uh, describe your perfect lifestyle. Let's monetize that so we know how much income you need to generate a year to sustain that lifestyle. It's the old how much is enough question. And then it's very easy to say, okay, well, if we need 120 grand a year in Aussie dollars, then we've got to create a income producing asset base of 2.4 mil based on a pretty conservative 5% return. Uh, if we've got 20 years as our, our, our break free timeline, then in property terms, you, we need to be securing two or three properties that's going to get us there over that, over that period. Uh, you've probably in, in your head and you sound, yourself and your partner sound like people who really crunch the numbers and, and probably do your due diligence before you jump in. Which is which is awesome. Uh, can you paint out what your ideal lifestyle looks like? Where are you now in comparison to that? And what are you going to do between now and then uh, to get yourself in that position? Yeah. Um, so it's it's kind of tough because in a way we can uh, or are living some of that freedom lifestyle stuff now. Of, yeah. You know, I I don't set an alarm apart from obviously. Um, <laughs> Like this morning, I had to set one to to get up for this podcast. <laughs> yeah, thanks um, for that, mate. Uh, but you know, generally, the only time I'll set an alarm is if I've got a flight to go catch earlier in the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you know, I wake up when I wake up. Um, I've got the freedom to go and hit the gym every morning, yeah. and then you know, go and do a workout, do everything I need to. You know, put my body and mind in a um, a great state to come back and be super productive on, yeah. uh, you know, building and running this, the, the businesses that I run now. Um, yeah. So in that way, you know, I kind of have a bunch of the, the freedom and everything that I yeah. want and need already. Cool. Um, but equally, you know, I am still also working towards, um, you know, a, a magic number as well um, of, 
you know, hitting a position where, yeah, um, yeah, you can draw down the X percent per year on um, on that and go from there. Um, mm. Now, that number ha- has shifted um, during this year, actually. <laughs> inflated um, or otherwise? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, inflated. Um, yeah. So, so uh, recently, uh, Dan Andrews, the, the host of the Tropical NBA podcast, yeah. uh, back in March this year, uh, released a book called Before the Exit, yeah. um, basically going through the process and talking about um, what happened when uh, they sold. They had a, a product, physical product business that was making cat furniture and yeah. um, uh, valet podium stands. Yeah. Um, and so they went through a process of selling that business and then afterwards had basically seller's remorse of like, oh. What now? Wow. You know, I've, I've got this, uh, you know, uh, influx of capital, but it's <laughs> not enough to completely uh, retire and do nothing on. Mm. So I still need to go and do something. Um, and, you know, trying to, to work around all that, yeah. um, which, um, yeah, it's um, sort of opened up my eyes because uh, one of the things I'd been considering for this year was potentially looking to um, – Either this year or next year, sell the web hosting company. Yeah, and then after reading that book, I was like, "Oh no, that's definitely not what I want." Like, in fact, I, you know, flipped a bunch of that stuff and, um, you know, started building the the retail hosting brand and going out and acquiring a bunch of other uh, small hosting companies yeah. to to try and, uh, yeah, like capitalize on on that stuff. In fact. Yeah, um, so and, partly you know, diversification, but partly an extension of the skills that you've got to generate another income stream. Yeah, and you know, chasing the the ongoing cash flows from those businesses and trying to, you know, with the web hosting stuff, like I've got um, a support agent in each of the three major time zones. So I've got a guy. Um, guy in Australia, I've got a guy in South Africa that covers the European time zone yeah. and a guy in America. So we've got, you know, 24 hour support on that. And yeah. those three guys mostly handle the, the largest majority of the, the work in that business of, you know, whenever a customer has an issue, they, they log a support ticket and it goes to those guys and they handle that. Um, yeah. which, you know, gives me a bunch of free time, time to actually go out and, you know, uh, continue to try and grow and build uh, these, these businesses. Yeah, yeah. So that I guess the question mark in my head, Kevin, um, is the sustainability of the current exercise. Given the, the there are some fairly major risks uh, that you've already discussed, uh, there's a relatively low uh, barrier to entry for someone wanting to jump in. And if some of the big heeled characters decided to uh, jump in and spend a, a crap load of money to become the authority in the spaces you're playing in. Uh, life could get pretty interesting. So, and yes, you're enjoying the the, li- the your ideal lifestyle, uh, but it probably and I'm, I'd like you to talk about this a bit. How much does it rely on you, and how much does it rely on you? And then, uh, what is that end play that's going to put you in that position where you've you've got the sustainable income level? Uh, without having to work too hard for it that, that gives you that ultimate freedom or or is that not even part of the plan? Yeah, I mean, for us, like for me and us at the moment, the, the big focus is going through and trying to acquire more web hosting companies uh, to yeah. roll into to that web hosting business um, yeah. with the idea being that, um, you know, compared to the the product review stuff, the, the web hosting stuff is a bunch more, uh, less turbulent. Um, yeah, and so you know the the current idea being basically that we're taking profits from the other businesses, from yeah. the you know free cash flows from the other businesses, yeah. and using that to go out and you know basically turn this flywheel uh, you know faster and faster yeah. on acquiring uh, you know more retail hosting companies to throw into that empire, uh, with the idea that eventually um, you know that's making plenty that. Again, you know, same situation of, you know, I've got support guys that run it, um, eventually probably have like a operations manager that sits in there below me and handles a bunch more of the, the handful of things that I still handle. Um, yeah. 
yeah and generate the uh, the freedom through that and sure there'll be like you know that nest egg of capital sitting there the um the war chest or whatever mm. um but you know more so focused on uh holding that asset and having that uh longer term uh longer term view of that so you know ideally the the web hosting company is like a 15 year thing for us of you yeah. know continuing to acquire and build that out um yeah and then you know who knows like there there are a few big names in the web hosting space that you know maybe once that's big enough you have an insanely large exit and get rid of it or yep. otherwise you just you know continue to hold it and yep. um you know where you're not having to you know let's say rely on say bank interest for example yep. as you know that five percent drawdown or you know not drawdown but five percent return on the a big um nest egg sitting there yeah um you know you can you can do that with businesses as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. and generally the the ROI of return on investment and return on capital in a business, even once you've got everything like uh, standardized and processized, uh, can be a, a lot higher um, percentages than it would be from the uh, you know just like bank interest, for example. Totally, yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And and the, the the key there that you've mentioned is a totally systemised, productised business that doesn't really need you at all. In fact, uh, whether you're there or not makes no difference. It's it and therefore can stand on its own feet. Uh, but you know, in the Australian context, as as you would know, there's a lot of business owners who believe that their wealth sits in there, but most of the goodwill sits in their head, and when they walk out the door, so does the business. So you, you clearly uh, uh, got the smarts there in relation to building an ecosystem uh, through those series of businesses that doesn't rely on you and does give you that sustainable income with the potential if the right buyer comes along and makes you an offer that you can't refuse and you've then got a lump that you can do something with and live off the proceeds. But have you got any thoughts around if it got to that, if you know you'd, someone came along and, and signed a massive cheque to take it all on board, what would you do with the money, mate? Where would you where would you park it? Um, yeah, that's like because that's not uh, something in my uh, you know current planned out timeline. It's something I haven't even really thought of at all. Mm. Um, I'm I'm sure you know there's there's always a little bit of fun looking at um, the the interest rates you can get around the world, and you know pretty much trying to ignore the uh, foreign currency uh, fluctuations that go with it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So like uh, you know, last year when I was in Cambodia, um, if you look at the banks there and you're willing to bank in a Khmer Real, which if you're on the ground isn't really the main currency there anyway, like most stuff's done in US dollars, despite yeah. you know the Khmer Real being the actual uh, official currency, yeah, if you do commercial real deposits, um, you get like seven or eight uh, percent interest on them. But you know you're subject to the currency fluctuations of that uh, rather weak uh, currency. Yeah. Um, so you know I'd, I'd probably float a little bit into those sort of things for a bit of fun. Um, and then yeah, I'm I'm super conservative, so a lot of it would end up just sitting in like uh, term deposits and other. Uh, mm. interest savings accounts um, yeah. or, um, you know, potentially I might let, – let's be honest, I'm a very entrepreneurial guy. Yeah. I'll probably find another business to uh, <laughs> go into and focus on even yeah. even if I've got, you know, that, that number in the bank account that I don't ever need to work a day yeah. in my life again because yeah, it's just what drives me. Like it's, Exactly. It's fun. Yeah, exactly. You don't strike me as someone who's going to twiddle their thumbs and play golf for a week, mate. I just can't even see it. So let, let's just talk about it, a little bit about your courage, mate, because to a lot of listeners, for someone who is sitting in a comfy, comfy role with SA Health in the IT area, to make the uh, what would be considered to be a massive leap to moving to a foreign country uh, in a completely new culture, and uh, starting from scratch, perhaps with a few dollars in your pocket based on, okay, we, I can survive for six, 12 months, whatever it is. What, is, what has given you the where – does, where has that courage come from that's allowed you to be able to make what most people would consider to be a pretty major step? 
Yeah, um, I mean, the war chest that we basically came over here with uh, would have allowed us to stay for somewhere between 18 to 24 months. Um, nice. you know, based on, you know, uh, an overstated uh, cost of living of around two, two and a half grand Aussie. Um, yeah. And, you know, like considering that, you know, we could probably cut that down a bit, which when we first hit the ground here, we were recording everything down to um, the the last BART, which is, uh, you know, the Thai BART's 25 to the Australian dollar roughly at the moment. So, you know, yeah. a bit under five cents. Um, it, tracking every last uh you know, yeah, little bit that we spent. Um, yeah, and you know we're like, okay, cool. Basically, you know, I had a couple of years runway, and if it all fell over, then well, hey, you've had this two year holiday. You've tried a few things, tried to get something off the ground, and uh, you know, you can just come back to Australia and get a job again. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm an account. Uh, sorry, I was in IT. Richard's an accountant. Um, yeah. I've got a teaching degree behind me as well. Like if, okay. if it all fell over, like there, there was plenty of, uh, yeah, the downside risk wasn't that high. Yeah. You know, sure. Sure. You, you know, you lose what 50 grand, 60 grand or whatever, but you've lived abroad for a couple of years and, uh, you know, given it a real shot. Um, Love it. and so when you frame it in that way, you sort of go, well, Hey, why not? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but what I'm hearing though is you're someone who takes calculated risks. So you've you've done the numbers. You've actually sat down and spreadsheeted this, uh, and then you've you've then uh, measured that exercise so you know where you are on track. And that's I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't spend enough time doing. They don't actually crunch the numbers. And it can be property, it can be whatever you've, your business, whatever it is. It's just that that sort of due diligence is something that. Uh, a lot don't it, it, it sounds like that's something is that something that's come naturally to you and i guess with your partner being an accountant that would certainly give it that sort of structure uh, but uh, is that something that um has always been there or is that something that you've uh, sort of added to as you've gone along i mean they so i started designing websites for people like when i was 13 or 14 years old and you know yeah. have you know, run various businesses, um, yeah. you know, mostly a smaller, like, side projects that whole time. So yeah. some of that, you know, I guess comes a little bit naturally or, you know, was, was learnt at a very young age. Um, yeah. But a bunch more of, uh, you know, that analytical spreadsheeting stuff is definitely Richard's influence, you know. When you've got someone who has, you know, gone through a commerce degree, gone through, you know, postgraduate to become a chartered accountant, has worked as a tax agent, all those things, like, yeah. uh, and, you know, and is an absolute wizard with Excel. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it does uh, make a bunch of that um, easier. Yeah. Plus, you know, you throw two very analytical minds together and, uh, you know, we probably say no to a bunch more deals and things than we ever say yes to. Yeah, great. You know, we're almost looking... We're almost a little too trigger happy on the no side. Okay, you know, okay. you, you look at something like so. We're looking at one acquisition recently, and like of a web hosting company, and start going through and like mm, this little bit here, and this bit here, and this bit here. These three small things, which you know, if you were, uh, you know, a bit more trigger happy to say yes, you'd go ah, oh, just look over that. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. On the reverse, we're looking and going. Oh, there's like a few little things that aren't quite necessarily in line that aren't adding up no like bang we're out like yeah yeah um and you know um listening to um uh so earlier this year when we're in austin we're at the uh, dynamite circle conference there which is the conference that's run by the people that run the tropical mba podcast yeah and one of the the guys that was speaking on stage is uh, or was uh, Richard Jalachandra. Um, so he's um, he's been a CEO of a bunch of uh, tech companies in the past, yep. um, in, and you know is, it was in that situation that you were describing there, where you know, hey, he's in his fifties, I believe, and you know has a bunch of cash sitting around. It was like, okay, well, what do I do? Yep. And he's um, you know, mostly worked in venture backed things in the past yep. and then, you know, started to come around and saw, you know, the similar stuff that I'd seen and was looking at, um, 
basically these physical product companies which are exclusively online brands, exclusive on Amazon, as there's this whole uh, group of people running these physical product brands where they go to China, have their brand slapped on a product, sometimes make some small tweaks to that product as well, okay. and then sell exclusively on the, the Amazon marketplaces. Um, and that sort of business model is called Amazon FBA, where okay. the FBA stands for Fulfilled by Amazon. Um, right. And so RJ was, uh, Richard Archander was looking at this stuff and going, well, hey, these, you know, these online businesses are selling um, – for generally like two and a half to three times profit, yep. like why don't I buy one of these smaller businesses and you know, you know, move from being this you know high level CEO who had a bunch of free time to you know, hey, let's see what happens when I actually can get my hands a little bit dirtier and you know pull some of these levers and see what changes with these uh, businesses. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he he started looking at that and. He was saying that he looked at, you know, a handful of businesses and the more that he looked at them, he was like, well, why would I just buy one? Um, and then basically has now gone and gotten a bunch of funding from some of his friends to go up and buy 101 of these wow. businesses and, uh, you know, roll them all up and generate, you know, this sense of scale um, from, you know, operational efficiencies from yeah, all that stuff. Of and, you know, when, when he was talking about looking at businesses, he was saying the same thing of like, you know, he says no to a bunch more deals than he ever says yes to. Yeah. You know, it's, it's somewhere, I think he was saying around the two to 5% is like his, uh, you know, yes. Yeah. Right. Of all the things he looks at. Yeah, that was in the old Apple exercise as well. They were always, um, uh, better at saying no than saying yes, and it's a really good discipline. What I'm interested in what you've just said there, uh, Kevin, is that the vertical integration that I'm hearing is that you know where there's you've been at the amplify end, at the front end in terms of getting the noise out there about an existing product, but and Amazon's still the glue. But sort of going back to the other production end and saying, right, let's modify this product. Let's let's put our own brand on it so it's slightly different from anything else. We'll still use Amazon for warehousing and distribution, uh, and we've probably still got the front end. That that's in terms of um, uh, elongating and then potentially protecting uh, the business model. It sounds like a pretty smart move. Is that is that something that uh, yourself and your partner are, uh, are looking at and getting involved in, or? Um, where does that sit in the context of things? Well, so for those sort of um, uh, businesses, the the issue, because like, I've got a bunch of friends that run those businesses, um, mm-hmm. and a, and I'm good friends with a guy who's a specialist broker in that space. Um, okay. So just a big, quick little shout out and hello to uh, Corin from the FBA broker, another uh, fellow former Australian um, who's you know doing the exact same you know, location independent thing that I'm doing. Right. Um, and when you chat to the people running those uh, fulfilled by Amazon physical product businesses, the big thing that they always face is, uh, you know, how much capital is tied up in stock all yes, the time. Yes, of course. Um, and so, you know, you, you might, uh, especially when they're launching new products, they're yep. basically taking all the profits, reinvesting that in increasing their stock levels. Yep. Um yeah, and so you might have this highly profitable business, but you know, no mm. free cash flows out of it because you're just throwing all that money back into uh, inventory. You know, increasing yeah. increasing inventory on existing lines and developing or releasing new lines. Yes, so, good call, good call. Yeah, that that is a very good call actually, and I, I mean, but, depending on the. Uh, the volume of uh, opportunity, the the just in time production things, probably going to fall short. Yeah, especially with most of those products being you know uh, produced in China and then uh, sold in either the US or Europe. Uh, you know, your mm. ship times out of China would just be yeah way too long. Like yeah, you know, I just spent a bunch of time in both those countries and uh, like in New York and some of the other US cities, for example, you can get two hour deliveries from Amazon. Yeah. Like people are getting more and more used to things being, you know, almost instantaneous for online shopping. Um, you know, two day delivery there is free and seems to take eternity compared to like, you know, the same day or two hour delivery options. Um, and so, you know, if you're freighting 
just in time from China, it just wouldn't happen. Um, yeah. But yeah, the the interesting little point with those FBA businesses, although they are capital intensive, you've got that same situation there of you know you're buying it for basically two and a half to three years profit for most of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for the largest part, you know, most of these business owners, uh, maybe they've touched, you know, a few of the samples, but generally the factory in China sends it to a shipping agent in the US who then ships it off to the Amazon warehouses. Amazon then packs them individually and sends them out to your uh, end customers. And so it's a sort of business that, you know, if you're looking at that, that end stage there of, well, hey, uh, how do I get a good return on my capital? It could be a, a great option there, you know, mm. with the, um, you know, return on capital being somewhere in that, you know, 30 to 40 something percent per annum. <laughs> That's a massive return. That's a massive return. Yeah. So was, again, and, was, you know, um, for something that is rather passive and doesn't need, you know, too much, uh, too much of your time, you know, you'd, yeah. you'd probably very easily run one of those on, you know, once it had been grown and, you know, to scale that you're acquiring it at, you'd probably run one of those on, you know, four to 10 hours per week. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. L- love your thinking, mate, in that regard. Um, uh, tell me, uh, just as a general question around this, uh, how important has a team approach been to your success to date, mate? Uh, Massively, like, um, you know, from the, the first uh, Amazon affiliate stuff where it was, um, you know, uh, relying on Richard to do about half of the, the process of, you know, his his process or his work in that was, you know, finding the keywords. And um, on the first site, he wrote uh, all the content. Um, going forward, he's then managed, you know, our team of writers to do that. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's very much an amplification factor that you get out of teams. Um, yeah. And, you know, same with the web hosting stuff. Like, we've got that, that global team that handles most of the stuff for us. Um, and then, you know, from there, um, we've, as, as I was talking before about, you know, having the, the uh, search engine optimization hosting stuff and then starting to build the retail hosting um We've got that vertical integration on the back end for those support guys where they handle tickets across all of our brands. Um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, with, without them, like, I'd, I'd either need to be setting an alarm every, you know, 90 minutes or so to, <laughs> to get up all, all night to uh, to make sure our customers get support within a reasonable you know, yeah. time frame or else, you know, it would be like when I very first launched it and I was doing all the support tickets and it was only happening during, like, you know, daytime hours over here in Thailand. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah, awesome, mate. Mate, um, uh, if you're talking to someone, uh, and let's let's say you're talking to someone who uh, is back in good old Adelaide and is in a job and is starting to look around that opportunities, and they they're not in a position either income or or savings or or deposit wise that property is even an option for them. Uh, and given the journey that you've been on. Uh, what would you say to them in terms of where they should, if they're looking at a side hustle or doing something in, in your space, is there an opportunity? And if so, what would you be suggesting they do? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess it's, like, there's so many different variations on there. You know, like if someone's if someone's got, you know, 10 or 20K saved up versus, you know, hey, yeah. I've got 500 bucks in the bank, sure, right? Sure. Um, if you got 500 bucks in the bank and you're looking to, you know, get started, then the only thing I could sort of suggest in terms of how you could maybe be location independent there would be to start looking at some location independent jobs. Um, and so that might be, you know, going to like job boards like dynamitejobs.co or, uh, you know, some of the uh, Upwork, some of those sort of remote work platforms and trying to yeah. either, you know, get, a more flexible, you know, location independent remote job that would allow them to travel while working. Yep. Or, you know, maybe there's a passion or interest that they've got that, you know, they can sort of somehow deliver some sort of a, a product or a service in. So, you know, if they're really into say scrapbooking, maybe they could, you know, start, you know, advertising on Gumtree and throwing together scrapbooks for people who a time poor, but really like the idea of, um, you know, 
having a really beautiful collection of memories for their holiday or something. Yeah. Um, if you got a bit more cash, then you know the door is still a little bit open, especially for the um, Amazon FBA stuff. In terms of you know ten to twenty grand would probably get you your um, your first order, and you could um, you know test out a product or two and try and sell them out through on Amazon and yep. you know that would be enough to get that flywheel started um, yeah yep. you know like the one of the guys I know is 22 years old from New Zealand um, and you know his first product uh, he launched with I think about 15 grand US um, based on the sale of a small content website that he built prior um, and then you know he's then gone and sold that uh, Amazon business for I think somewhere in the 150 to 200k US nice. and then has you know continued to you know uh, build out new Amazon brands from there mm, yeah it's a a new world of opportunity there's there's no question about it and for someone who's opportunistic and can identify both a need and a gap uh, this seems like a uh, a sea of of uh, possibility there so uh, it, yeah and and yeah. you know depending on the, the individual then you know something as simple as just moving to a location independent job which um yeah you know allows them to travel while working yeah. could be you know could be all the freedom that they want to you know come and spend you know a month or two in like bali or thailand and then yeah. a few months in europe and then a few months in the us and you know yeah. just slowly travel around and yeah. you know see the world while doing that and you know yeah. there's a bunch of cities around the world with um you know a, a lot lower cost of living than yeah. um anywhere in australia Agreed. um and so like you can you can jump on nomadlist.com and sort of get an idea of how much it costs to live in any city so like yeah. you know berlin generally speaking berlin in germany can be cheaper than a lot of australian cities really obviously yeah obviously a lot of cities in um in Asia as well, so, you know, Chiang Mai or Bangkok or, yeah. you know, even the islands in the south like uh, Phuket, Koh Samui, et cetera, can be cheaper than Australia. Yeah. Bali's, um, you know, very popular with the digital nomad crew as well. And, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, if if you're not, uh, depending on where you hang out in Bali, so, like, if you go more inland to Ubud rather than, you know, the Kuta Beach where the, yeah. a bunch of the uh, Australian drunken bogans <laughs> hang out. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, it, it can be a, a pretty nice uh, place. And yeah. the thing that you're starting to see pop up more and more around the world is um, these, like, Australian-themed uh, cafes as well, yes. which have, you know, that Melbourne level of coffee. Um, yeah. So we've, so we've got um, some really good coffee stores here in Chiang Mai. Uh, there's a few of them popping up in Bali that I've noticed of, you know, like the, yeah. you know, quite often with, um, you know, Australian owners that, you know, bring that Melbourne coffee ethos across. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's never been a better time to be alive, mate. The, the model that uh, my good wife and I are operating on is we've, we've created our asset base here in Australia and uh, the business we're now in in, in helping uh, investors to uh, go down a similar path with, with obviously as property as, as part of that base is that what it's done is given us the freedom now and, and the last few years we've actually been tracking around the globe looking at places where we would spend three months stint. So the, the game plan on our here it is spend six months in Australia just uh, enjoying life but keeping an eye on things because we, we still... A bit like you said, I, we, we're never going to be able to twiddle our thumbs. We, we actually really enjoy what we're doing. We get a lot of satisfaction out of helping people on, on that journey. So I don't want to ever stop doing that. I just want to be able to be very fussy about when I do it and who I do it with. And uh, so we've been, well, I've been to Mendoza in South America because it's, I'm a, I'm a field hockey player and uh, there's a great field hockey uh, association in Mendoza the wine wine industry in that area is sensational it's a it's a, yeah. a good climate I, I'm one of those rare ones I've got a dodgy thyroid so humidity really plays havoc uh, with me so I, I, I need sort of drier colder climates and when I just drew a line around the globe based on that latitude and that we've just yeah. been picking off those locations to say right oh well yeah this is a spot we can spend we can spend three months here and then we can spend three months there 
uh, and just just the ability to do that with the the uh, resources and technology that we've got at our fingertips is just as I say, mate, never been a better time to be alive. Uh, tell us about your, you know, that, that, that we've sort of touched on this, but uh, uh, from what I'm hearing, Australia probably doesn't play any further role much in your in your future. Would I be right in saying that? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely at this point, it's, um, you know, it's a spot that, um, so, like, we're back last year for Christmas and New Year's for, you know, like two or three weeks. Um, yeah, yeah. This year, we're basically uh, parachuting in for, like, about a week across Christmas <laughs> and um, going to yeah. be back up here for New Year's uh, this year. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like, family's still there, so, you know, yeah. hey, but equally, like, um like both of our parents have been out here to Chiang Mai. Um, yeah. Richard's parents came out to Berlin when we were there uh, across the summer. So, nice. yeah, we're sort of starting to see, you know, uh, our parents in more spots around the world. Um, yeah. And, you know, as, as well, like like my brother lives over in uh, the States. So, you know, like I've hung out with him obviously in, in the U.S., um, he came over to Europe when we were there and we hung out um, in uh, France for a little bit. And so, you know, with, with family, or at least my family being all over the globe, it's, um, yeah. you know, it's Australia definitely feels like a, a spot that I'm spending, you know, or don't really have as much interest <laughs> to be in. Yeah, well, it'd probably feel like a time warp when you come back to Adelaide, does it? It's. I mean, there's there's a lot of nostalgia for sure. Uh, you know, whenever I'm back in Adelaide, um, you know, still, you know, a bunch of people I've worked with and friends and family are still there. Yeah. Um, but equally, you know, uh, when I really want to, you know, hammer in and start, you know, really getting into business talks with people, then uh, for the largest part, you know, I don't have as much of that. Uh, network in Adelaide as I do mm. out here in Thailand. Mm, it just must be awesome to be swimming in a pool of people who share the same belief in in living a uh, location independent life, generating a business that gives you that that flexibility. Mate, it must uh, be very refreshing. I would would have thought, mate. Um, let me kick into the what I call the ambush, which is uh, five quick questions uh, that focus in in on stuff that uh, the listeners love to drill into. And let me yep. kick that off by just asking you, what's your favourite quote and why? It could be one of your own. It could be one you've picked up. Uh, any that come to mind? Well, there was one that um, came through yesterday on uh, Instagram and, like, I screenshotted it and I'm, I'm going to have to bleep out uh, one of the words <laughs> from it. Um, okay. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll post it later and you can drop a link to it in the, the show notes. Awesome. Um, Great. So it says, uh, do what you love and you'll, and then has the words, uh, never work a day in your life crossed out in, and instead continues on uh, and reads, do what you love and you'll work super blank hard all the time with no separation or any boundaries and also take everything extremely personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, love it, love it. Yeah. And, you know, like the last um, last few years, like, you know, uh, building and running a, a business where you are customer facing, um, you know, directly with the, the web hosting customers. Uh, yeah. th- there are times that you get some harsh and sometimes justified from, you know, like mistakes that were made, sometimes uh, completely unjustified, uh, yeah. you know, uh, remarks that are made. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it can sometimes hurt a bit when you, you get those uh, remarks. Yeah, but, I, hey, I, that's that's business. Yeah, it is. It is. I I, I think, yeah, and I, I don't want to go from too much of a tangent here, but I think uh, hiding behind social media and the impersonalisation that uh, that creates in terms of communication, people uh, tend to be a lot more forthright and a lot braver than what they would be if they were looking in your eyes and and saying the same thing. And uh, so I tend to take with a pinch of salt some of that commentary because uh, it's. It, to be honest, I find it. A lot of it, a little bit gutless, but um, not not saying that uh, <laughs> uh, we certainly make mistakes and we we encourage the feedback because we want to learn from it because we don't hear about it then we don't know that we're making mistakes sometimes. 
but uh, I, I have found that there's a lot of people that become particularly brave over subjects that uh, sitting across the table they might take a different tack. Mate, very interesting. Uh, let me ask you then, what would be the top book and the top top podcast that you would suggest people have a read and, and a listen to, and why? Right. Um, so for people getting started out on this journey, I would uh, highly recommend, even though it's over 10 years old now and some of the specific tactics that it mentions are outdated, but the core... You know, if you read for the core general uh, principles of it um, and then, you know, work out how to apply it uh, in your own sense, then uh, The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss yeah. is still a really good book. It's a classic, um, isn't it? Yep. It's, it's a classic. It's one that I revisited uh, late last year. Yep. Um, and, you know, so some of the stuff like where it might mention a specific service or a specific website for a way to do a thing, like, you know, hey, it's the book was written 10 years ago, yeah. so some of that's, you know, outdated and moved on. But if you use that as, I guess, like a core foundational principle of like, hey, here's how you can, you know, build a business that doesn't rely too heavily on you and has a bunch of, you know, processes and everything in place that, yeah. allows it to uh, to function without you, yeah. then it's a really great resource. Yeah, um, great. And, you know, the, the book that's really uh, impacted my thinking this year, as I mentioned earlier in the podcast, is uh, Before the Exit by Dan Andrews, which you can find on Amazon. Yeah, nice, mate. And podcast-wise, what, uh, what are some of your favourites and why? Yeah, um, so huge fan of... A uh, fellow Adelaidean podcast to yours, uh, Rooster Radio, uh, yes. put out by Monty. Um, yeah, it's a legend. That's, you know, there's, there's a bunch of uh, real, authentic, uh, you know, slightly more raw interviews than you'd probably get in uh, <laughs> other podcasts, mostly yeah. because, you know, they're, they're done face-to-face, in person, yeah. and, you know, uh, with maybe some names that you haven't heard before on podcasts, which is is great. Um, yeah, yeah. Also, as well, you know, I can't go past mentioning the Tropical NBA podcast because yeah, uh, you know, um, like I've been on there a couple of times. It's a great podcast, and those yeah. guys have you know a wealth of experience from building and running uh, you know, their businesses. Um, yeah. Dan, especially, you know, spent a bunch of time living in uh, Bali while they were building that business, yeah. and then more recently, he's. He's gotten pretty heavily into cycling, and Chiang Mai has some great uh, spots for cycling. So there's like mountains and big long, yeah. like mountains to go climb and big long sort of flat sections to ride. So, yeah, uh, you know, he'll spend three to six months of the year out here in Chiang Mai now, nice. and you know, do a bunch of his cycling prep uh, while he's out here. So, you know, yeah. uh, definitely dropping on BA. Yeah, it's an absolute cracker, mate. I love that one myself. I've been listening to that one for years. Now, this one's going to be a little bit left field, but uh, it's it's something that people constantly talk about when I catch up with them. Uh, and it's it's going to be a little bit uh, different for you, but um, because there's a, a sense in Australia that most, most people feel like they pay too much tax. Uh, what's the top thing that, that you've done to minimise the tax that you pay, mate? Yeah, uh, so, I mean, when I was doing property, uh, the, the big thing that we had because it was, um, like, the properties themselves were positively geared, uh, but they had, uh, you know, so they, sorry, they were cash flow positive properties, but then because they are new builds, they had depreciation schedules and yes. all of that. Yep. Um, so there were paper losses, yep. um, you know, for that s- structure, like, we'd, we'd set up, you know, a trust and all of that to, to make that as, you know, tax effective as possible. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you're in that space, um, you know, in the property space, definitely sit down with a, a good accountant and try and work out the best uh, legal structure, ideally before you uh, go out and buy a bunch of properties. Yeah. Um, yeah. But even still, you know, there are situations where you can make a bunch of those changes and the payback period can be a couple of years for, you know, the professional fees plus the land tax and et cetera in uh, yeah. transferring the properties to the new entities that, you know, really make it worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good tips. Yeah. Yeah, love that. Um, now, turning to the in- investment arena, what's the both the 
the worst and the best piece of investment advice that you've ever received, mate? Um, worst investment advice. Oh. <laughs> uh, probably, probably worst investment advice might have even been some, you know, some uneducated, uh, you know, discussions with uh, friends saying, yeah, just go buy property because you'll make money. Um, <laughs> but equally, you know, knowing what you're doing in that space and, um, you know, going through that process, um, like once once you know what you're doing, then it can be great investment advice as well. But you really need to buy the right properties, which is yeah. the one thing that most people overlook. Um, yeah they become very emotionally attached to a specific property and just say, no, I must have this one rather than, you know, yeah. like, you know, like now with any sort of investment, I look at it very clinically and detached. And that's probably the, the best piece of advice that I've received is like, don't get too emotionally attached to any specific one uh, potential investment opportunity that you're looking at. Um, so, you know, there have been ones that I've really liked and really want to go in on, but the, uh, the numbers just don't make sense or, yeah. you know, there's been too many red flags in it and I've just gone, yeah, no, like backing out of this one. Yeah, great advice. Um, great advice. It's, I've often said that if uh, if kebabs uh, had a better growth and a better return than property, I'd invest in kebabs. I don't, I'd, uh, property for me is just a money back box in the shape of a house. And yep. uh, so I'd completely detach from that process and uh, I, I, what you've just said there is is awesome advice mate because it, the the emotional attachment to housing in particular if you're in the residential space is such that you know if I live in a house therefore I I'm going to be a good investor because all I have to do is go and buy another house whereas uh, that's that's the last thing you know, that we suggest people think about in the in the property front and what I hear you doing in the online business space as well in terms of being very uh, having a very strong criteria on what passes a test uh, for yourself and Richard to get involved in uh, is is adopting the that same number crunching, quite clinical approach to make sure that it's actually going to work, not what feels right. Brilliant. Okay. Yeah. Last one of the ambush, mate. Uh, what, what's a personal habit that contributes to your success that you'd like to share with us? Uh. So I touched on it a little bit earlier in the, the episode, and for me that's um, going to the gym uh, yeah. generally at least every weekday, and, you know, I try to get there on the, the weekends as well. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the the one thing that I uh, read about that is that the earlier in the day that you can get to the gym, the more of the day that you're going to, you know, experience the benefits of, you know, the, the high of, the endorphins are released through exercise and the, the clarity and focus you can get out of that. Um, and so, you know, for me, that's hit the gym every morning. Um, yeah. And, you know, on, on the weekends, maybe it's a little bit later or, you know, some days it doesn't happen. But yeah, every weekday, like when I'm, you know, actually sitting down to work, like I don't view it as, oh, no, here's an hour or whatever out of my day that I can't sit down in front of my computer and work <laughs> at. In, in fact, it's the opposite. Like, you know, yeah. I invest that hour and, you know, it pays dividends. Totally. I'm right with you there, mate. It's really interesting you mentioned uh, that uh, the earlier you do it, the better the benefits because I just recent because I'm the same. I The first thing I do, I get up, we have small time with our dogs and then because uh, we've got some, four rescue samoids that um, – lighten up our life and then I head down to the gym uh, which is, we live in a country property but it's it's just over the hill and down the road and uh, that sets my day up, I come out of there feeling pumped, uh, clears the head gets rid of the old male aggro I'm re- ready to take on the day and I'm feeling sort of calm and peaceful I saw a TV show on SBS recently that talked about that, that uh, supposedly there's, there's more benefits and you get more out of exercising in the evening. And it, that's never worked for me. I, I'm sluggish. I don't really feel like doing it. If I'm tired, it's like, ah, no, I won't do it today. Whereas if I if I force myself, uh, I don't even feel like I'm for, I actually look forward to it, jump out of bed and head to the, the gym. I've, I've got a smile on my face before I even start the day. So um, it sounds like you uh, share the same view, mate. 
Definitely. Um, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't heard that because all the stuff I'd heard is that, you know, if you're working out in the evening, you're kind of wasting some of those benefits because it's, you know, you're not, uh, you're just using it for the, the evening and then going to sleep. Whereas, you know, if you do it earlier in the day, then you ride the, the endorphins throughout the day. Yeah. But, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Likewise. It, it's, everyone's got a, a different view, I guess, but uh, it, it, it pricked my ears up when I heard them say that. And I thought, well, it doesn't really ring true for me. Maybe they're trying, yeah. to, trying to sell evening gym memberships. I don't know, mate. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, that mate, uh, really love the conversation. Uh, it's, I th- really think it's going to get people thinking about different alternatives because a lot of us here in Aussie, we're very comfortable and we, a lot of us follow down the traditional path. Uh, I love what you're doing. I love the courage uh, and and the way you've just embraced the opportunity. And but done it smartly. You've you've crunched the numbers. You've you've while you say you're conservative, I think uh, you're conservative in terms of calculating the risk that you take and knowing what the fallback position is. So full respect for that. But um, uh, just to close on, Kevin, what what's next new and exciting for you and Richard moving forward? Yeah, um, so, I mean, for us, we are just got back to Thailand and sort of in the process of, you know, settling in again. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that we're sort of, uh, you know, new and excited about is this process of uh, going through the acquisition stuff, which, um, yeah. you know, we've only recently started. Um, you know, if you'd spoken to me a year ago, I would have said, why would you, why would you acquire? Mm. But then now, you know, like I've, Definitely, you know, like, because I was more focused on sell and now, you know, the more that I'm getting into it, the more that I'm like, this just makes perfect sense. Like, you know, keep it quiet and just buy as much stuff as you can. <laughs> mm. Mm. And that, that gives you, I guess, the volume, but also you, you can bring the systems that you've already developed to, to get much more efficiency out of uh, something that's that's already up and running. So there's some pretty big upside there I'm, I'm hearing. So awesome sure. stuff, uh, mate. Um, for those who do have an interest in in the uh, the broad spectrum of things you're doing in the space, and they wanted to reach out to you, what's what's the best way they can contact you, mate? Yeah. Um, so I blog very occasionally over at <laughs> uh, kevingram.com. Uh, I've actually thrown up a couple more recent posts up there with, you know, travel notes on a couple of cities because I kept having these, like, messages in my phone that I would just copy-paste whenever friends were going places. I was like, no, I just need to throw them up on the site, so they're up there now. <laughs> awesome. um, so so that's over at kevingram.com if, uh, you know, if you're interested in that. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'm slightly active on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, the username over there is at underscore Kevin Graham on both of them. Yep. Um, and just on the back of this show, I'll uh, uh, post that quote on uh, Instagram. I'll send you the links to the few things we spoke about as well so you can right. throw them in the show notes and Please. people can click through to all those things. Yeah, awesome, mate. Look, um, very appreciative of you spending some time, Kevin. I, th- I think uh, uh, what you'll be doing as a result of our chat today is just opening people's minds to uh, other opportunity. Uh, so I'm uh, very appreciative of you uh, being so open uh, to, to take us on your journey and uh, I have absolutely no doubt that you're g- going to continue to kick ass in, in that space mate so um, uh, keep up the great work and uh, we'll look forward to following your um, future success thanks mate great, thank you for having me thanks Kevin, cheers mate well freedom fighters how good was that to get a summary of all this investment gold in the show notes just email me on hello at khgroup.com.au that's h-e-l-l-o at khgroup.com.au or check us out at www.bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested I look forward to joining you next week for another episode of the Get Invested podcast so thanks for listening and as always dream as if you live forever and live as if you'll die tomorrow